so uh, thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, well, actually, I already achieved a milestone today because I'm inside the club and not at the door, so I'm not a bouncer, so that's already a good sign. Uh, for that also, typically I start my presentation with a question and then I see how many hands are going up, but to be honest, I will only see the blue people there, so I cannot do that today, apparently, but uh, maybe we have one question there. So. Guardians of the grid, what is it and who are we? That's maybe also an important question. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Nick Foulon. I'm uh, represented here by uh, Starlight or Star King. Uh, yeah, should have looked that one up. Uh, I used to be SOC manager at Enviso. Now I'm doing uh, OT research. And uh, yeah, my hobbies are uh, reading. I also like geopolitics, history, and in general, I like to go on adventures. I will start with my hobbies. My hobby is I'm a gym addict, so sorry for that. Uh, so I also do like reading, but typically it's related to food or gym exercises. Uh, no, so my name is Jeroen van der Leur. I'm a senior expert within Enviso. Uh, typically I'm doing research projects, working with all of our team members related to uh, new services that we are developing. Uh, also, maybe a hot topic, yeah, AI, uh, that's also included in there. But today we're not going to talk about AI. We are going to talk about OT and adversary emulation. So probably you're wondering, you're the technical expert, and I have to be honest, I'm a little bit collateral damage because Nick is really the expert in OT. So what am I doing here or when did I became interested in OT? Maybe I'm just going to try and ask a question. How many of you love Belgian beers? Well, uh, oh, okay. Oh, I, I can actually see in the back now. So thanks, thanks for that nice response. So when did I become actually interested in OT? When they attacked Duvel, then it became personal. <laughs> so yeah, that actually happened. So the entire factory and transportation uh, stock and everything went down there. It was uh, due to a ransomware attack that also breached or had an impact on the operational capacity of Duvel. But uh, yeah, enough about that. Let's see what we are going to try and answer today or try to explain today. So really, adverse emulation eh, on OT, is it important? Hopefully it is, otherwise we are losing 50 minutes uh, here. So let's see that uh, it's important and let's give you some practical examples. So that's also what we are going to be covering today. So I'm not going through because we will see that slide over and over again. So these are actually the topics we are going to cover. First of all, let's start a little bit with purple teaming. Now, how many of you already know the concepts of red teaming and Blue teaming and purple teaming and green teaming and yellow, t yellow, eh? anybody knows yellow team? Okay, no. So, purple teaming, an introduction to purple teaming. How are we going to do it in OT? Well, purple teaming, again, everybody knows actually purple teaming, so it's just combining red and blue and then you have purple. So, blue team typically eh, defending, red team is actually on the offensive side. Now taking that together, they have one common goal and that's really like increasing your security posture. So what does that mean eh, if you have red versus blue? Well, typically there the result or the focus is really an assessment. So they are really going to assess the environment. If you do it in a purple team modus, then it's really focused on improvement. So that's maybe a good difference to see, okay, what is now the real difference between Red teaming versus purple teaming. Why is it important? Because I do admit red teaming is necessary and will always remain necessary, but purple teaming can also help you out to actually get an additional objective there. What we have defined is how purple do you want to go. I'm not going to go into detail, but we just defined three levels of purple teaming. We have like the manual one or level one, which is just a blue addition to a red team. We have the purple team exercises, which is typically then defined as level two, where we are really going to work together on the exercise. And then the last stage is really going into continuous purple teaming, which also includes adversary emulation, which we are going to cover and which is also being described in the next slide. So what is adversary emulation? Well, it's actually running the techniques that an adversary is using to attack a certain uh, environment. So we are going to do research on that. We are going to define 
the emulation plan, and then we are actually going to do that emulation. It can also be a red team. So if you had a red team and you have all those techniques available, well, probably you can also turn it into a more continuous purple teaming effort and actually start an adversary emulation campaign with the techniques that were used during the red team. If they are describing their secret sauce that they are using, of course. Now, that's all good. And typically, we see a lot of purple teaming being done in IT environments, but what about OT environments? Typically, we get these answers. OT, not necessary. Why not? Because it's isolated. Okay, that's actually the pr principle of never assume breach. So really against, for example, like a zero trust model. So they never assume that a breach can happen there. Updates and testing. Well, indeed, if you are going to run an update or a test, well, typically it's already being tested by the vendor. They know it works and they apply like the update on the production environment itself. So there are also security testing. Normally, is not really allowed in certain OT environments. Why? Because, well, it could have an impact and even implementing security controls can have an operational impact. So that are typically the reasons they give on why we are not doing red teams or purple teams within OT environments. But is that really true? Do we really know that if in a certain case we cannot do purple teaming on OT environments? Well, it could be. In many cases, it is also like that. Anybody ever tried running a vulnerability scanner in an OT environment? Then I know you attacked Duval, you were the one. <laughs> so running a vulnerability scanner in an, uh, with payloads in an uh, OT environment is never a good idea due to uh, yeah, operational impact. So is it an assumption or is it fact? Well, let's describe an incident that recently occurred. So a customer of us, they said, ah, we have a breach. We also have an incident response team. Incident response team, we have like a nice A-team look-alike uh, vehicle. So then we go to the customer with that one. Um, and then we actually start our incident response procedure. They define the scope. They say, okay, look, a user clicked on a phishing mail. You see it here. So the phishing mail was sent. The host was compromised. And we analyzed that host. They tried to connect towards OT environments, but we never saw anything else. And the customer also said, like, okay, look, at these are the systems you can analyze. And for the rest, uh, yeah, well, that's actually the scope of our incident response. So and there was an IT security alert. That incident was actually handled within three days. And the threat was mitigated after four days. However, we are in a club, so this is I actually didn't do it today, so it was, uh, it's, it's called a coincidence. So, Drax, it's actually a quote from the movie. So, there are two types of beings in the universe, those who dance and those who do not dance. Now, I'm not going to dance today, so we are in a club, but no, I'm not going to. The wine bar is open, maybe afterwards, no. Uh, so, in any case, something happened there. So, we got an urgent call. What actually happened? Well, after a couple of days, actually one month, they realized that their entire factory was being breached. So the attacker was able to send a payload towards a remote service host, so actually a service host within the OT system, and from that host they were able to actually execute payloads on that factory which resulted in an IT security alert, of course. The incident was handled 30 days after the fact or after the initial entry. Threat was mitigated, but in the end, they were not able to get that specific factory. It was not an entire company, but that specific factory, they were not able to get it up and running again. So factory closed for that perspective. So they are rebuilding now their entire environment. That's, of course, not a good idea. But we have some recommendations for that one. So I will give the word to Nick. Yeah, thank you. I'll just take Nick a quick also. lead. Yeah, thank you. So uh, bridging IT and OT. Uh, why do we need a unified approach for uh, yeah, IT and OT security? Uh, just going to check if this is the correct button. Yes, 
Okay, so basically, uh, what if we can dance? What do we mean by that? Uh, we have our IT environment, which is typically monitored, but with integrated monitoring, we propose that you also start monitoring your OT environment. Why? Because then we can dance, of course. Yeah. If something happens in your, OTM, uh, your IT environment, suddenly, if you have OT monitoring, your analysts can go to the other console, and they can check for alerts there as well. So they can start correlating. So that's what we mean uh, by dancing here. Uh, maybe analyzing incidents, uh, a comparative study. So for the people who don't know uh, the difference between IT and OT, there are quite some differences. Uh, in general, in IT, when something happens, uh, think of a ransomware attack. What is the first thing that you do if something happened? I hope that every company tries to do that. They try to restore a backup, right? But in an OT environment, that's not so easy, right? Because in the case of Duvel, if they attack a plant and they physically destroy all the machines there through code or something like that, well, I think it's pretty hard to install or to, you know, like take a backup of your factory and put it up and run it again. I don't think that's going to happen fast. I don't think in think it's going to happen in a day. It's probably going to take a couple of weeks, months, maybe even years, depending yeah, on uh, your suppliers and your vendors. So uh, the impact is also different. In IT, you will speak about business operations, financial loss, data and uh, confidentiality and integrity, stuff like that. But in an OT environment, what I think is very important is your physical safety, operational continu continuity. So what do we mean with, the, uh, with that? Basically, you are a plant, you are producing stuff. Each hour you produce, that earns you money. If you don't produce, you don't earn money. And yeah, if you ask your boss, if we don't make money with the company, don't think that's uh, something that your boss will like. So uh, uh, I think uh, it's very important that we keep the factory on turning. And then, yeah, I think your response focus is also different. Eh? So for example, in IT, we want to make sure that the data is still the same and that we can uh, restore from the backup, but in uh, OT, yeah, that physical safety is pretty important. Eh? If I go for a response to a factory and I know that there is uh, chances of it exploding, well, that might be dangerous for me as well. And I don't want to die. So, so I think uh, that's a bit of a difference between the two. Uh, symbiosis and early breach detection. Eh? So as I said before, early detection in both IT and OT, IT and OT, uh, allows teams to isolate and mitigate the threat before it causes significant harm. What do we mean by that? You need integrated monitoring and detection systems, both in your IT, but in your OT. Make sure that they, for example, come into the same seam, and from your same, from your seam, you pull them into a ticketing system. So that's what we mean with integrated monitoring, so that when your analyst looks at the alerts, he can see, ah, but we see a phishing link here, and we see that it ho goes to host X, and then suddenly from host X, we maybe see a scan to, I assume that it's a flat network, eh? and we see a scan towards the OT. Uh, that's maybe not uh, a good thing, so uh, that correlation is very important there. Uh, enhanced threat intelligence, why do we put it here? Because if you start monitoring in your OT environment, what you will get from these sensors is typically also an asset list. What is an asset list? It's a list of all the devices in your plant. If you have a list of all the devices in your plant, you will probably also get some vulnerability data, right? And if you know which vulnerabilities you have in your plant, well, then we go to the next uh, piece, uh, the proactive security posture. If you know which vulnerabilities you have in your plant, well, it's pretty easy to look around the globe and at the news and check what the APTs are doing. And if you see that they are exploiting something, for example, something with Siemens or Rockwell, something very high and critical, well, we see that. We look at your environment and we say, hey, but we'll do some proactive monitoring or maybe some firewall rules. So uh, it really allows for a proactive security posture. Then uh, maybe also a word on defensive strategies uh, because always interesting, interesting to know why we do and how we do it. So um, maybe, uh, again, the uh, intrusion detection systems and the intrusion prevention systems, what do we mean by that? Monitor your network. If you monitor your network and if you know what goes over your network, well, then you can do an anomaly detection. Maybe a very simple 
example with that. If you have a PLC and that is just running and it's always getting the same code, if your PLC suddenly start get, uh, starts pinging the whole entire network, well, it's probably not possible, but that would be very weird. And I hope that you have somebody, uh, an analyst or something like that, who is looking at your alert because it's uh, maybe an indication that something is wrong, right? So you also need a secured OT architecture, uh, which we provide through the architecture uh, review of your environment. Make sure that you have segmentation, that you have firewalls, all the fancy stuff there. But again, then also uh, a monitoring tool uh, where we work with Claro, Nozomi or Microsoft. Uh, then threat intelligence integration. I also spoke about that. Uh, if you have a view on your assets, if you know what's on your network, then you can also defend specifically towards those devices. And then of course, yeah, the asset management and the vulnerability management uh, that all comes together there. Uh, maybe a uh, question, segmentation, who has heard of that and who is doing that actually in their IT environment? Can I see some hands? Yeah, I see some hands. Okay. If you have a factory, technically, uh, there is also the Pardue model, which is a logical model to uh, basically segment even further. But that's with uh, five or six steps. Who is doing that in their IT, uh, so not in their IT, but in their OT environments? Has anybody, I see one hand, two hands, and then, yeah, I don't have a lot of visibility. I need a network sensor here, but... Uh, Focus on the blue light. <laughs> Uh, but uh, hey, according to us, one of the most important things or one of the most valuable things in the beginning that you can have is an asset inventory and uh, yeah, the asset discovery and uh, the management because if you have a new node on your network suddenly, well, that should raise an alert because that's a clear indication that at least somebody new is on your network. Uh, so asset discovery. Then uh, OT communication is also generally easier to establish a baseline uh, because uh, I'll go back to my uh, example with the PLC. PLCs, uh, they are uh, cyclical. Your production normally is churning out products. There is not a lot of things that deviate. If somebody does a program upload or something like that, well, that's a clear anomaly, right? So uh, I think in essence, network monitoring analysis is very valuable for detecting OT incidents. And then my part, <laughs> adversary emulation. So I already mentioned it or I already uh, asked the question. No, I didn't ask the question yet. So who of you actually already did a penetration test on a OT environment? There are a couple of hands. So indeed, there are some controlled environments. I typically they are controlled because otherwise it would have some kind of risk. But we also do penetration testing against OT environments. And typically that's a very controlled environment. It doesn't have the full scale of their production OT environment. So that's also with adverse emulation. One important thing that we typically do, and also the fun part, you need to explain to your five-year-old son that you're building these kind of things, which is very nice. So we started actually building our own cyber ranges. So it all started with a small little train, which is actually, there's the laser which is actually that one. So it started with a small train, which was actually a capture the flag on events like this, on events uh, in Belgium, uh, in Germany, uh, where we actually deployed that train and where we could do certain attacks on that uh, environment. Now, based on that little thing, we got some interesting requests from customers like, okay, together with you, would it be possible to actually build an actual cyber range for our specific scenario. So we actually built here, it's like a water bridge and there it's like a power plant in the water. So we built the entire cyber range with those PLC controllers with all the functionality, functionality that they have. Now typically those kind of cyber ranges are used for training, user awareness, what can happen. It's really like the visual effect. So imagine you need to explain to your CEO, that you have a vulnerability on your o OT environment and that the bridge will actually turn completely around. Well, it's always better to visualize it. So the visual aspect actually helps a lot. Also to explain OT security towards, for example, OT engineers. 
Now, what's another use case related to cyber agents? Well, testing and emulation. So the things we are doing now, if we want to execute an attack, well, emulation can then be done against that controlled environment, which is a cyber range. And you can also immediately see the impact when you are executing that specific adversary, which we will see in the nice demonstration we have. So maybe uh, we should move a little bit forward there. You can also test your digital forensic procedures. So in many cases, if we come with an incident response case into an OT environment, there are certain procedures, but typically there are always steps missing or steps being forgotten. So you can actually then test them and see which kind of evidences you have. And last but not least, you can also test your detection capabilities. Or imagine you are looking for a product that can actually monitor that environment. Well, with your cyber range, you can then now test, okay, let's execute some attacks, let's see what they got, let's see how they are detecting those kind of attacks. So, pretty interesting and something uh, we are actually uh, doing quite often uh, related to uh, OT security. If we then go to adverse simulation, who ever played around with Caldera? A couple of you. So Caldera is developed by Mitre. Uh, it's an adversary emulation tool. It's open source, easy to deploy. In that sense, you just download the Git repo and you install it. And there are certain dependencies that you then need to use chat GTP for, for example, to fix it. But uh, there are certain dependencies that uh, you need to install. But in theory, Caldera is set up in like 10 minutes or something. So Caldera, actually, it's a web interface uh, where you can then execute certain campaigns. And what's also good there, well, you have logical components in there. You have abilities in there. What are abilities? Well, actually, it are the techniques, the attack techniques that are known, for example, by Mitre Attack. So they have a plugin with Atomic Red Team and all those atomics are already available by default in Caldera. You also have adversaries, which we will showcase later on, but that's actually the logical flow of all those techniques together with input and output, so doing step by step the actual attack. And then operations, that's the actual run of the attack. So. If it's not really clear, you will see it in the demonstration. Also, we created a blog post on how you can set up Caldera and how you can easily create your own campaigns. So uh, that's the link uh, on top of uh, this page. Now, what is also an important logical component within Caldera, especially for our talk, well, you even have an OT plugin. So Caldera has many plugins. You can create your own plugins. So uh, yeah, you can actually develop your own plugin. The skeleton is on the left side of the screen. So it's also a GitHub project. You download it. You create your own vulnerability. Uh, your own vulnerability. Yeah, you can also create your own vulnerability. But uh, you create your own plugin. And then you can actually upload it towards Caldera in the plugins directory. It's as easy as that. No, you also need to adapt the default.yaml file. But in any case, it's pretty easy to set up. It's not pretty easy to construct a plugin. That's something else. Now, in any case, we already updated our Caldera instance. So you can see a little bit on the right side of the screen. Sorry, the left side on the screen. For me, the right. <laughs> Always difficult. Uh, so on the left side of the screen, you can see already all the plugins that are there. And the only plugin I added was the OT plugin, which has certain OT protocols here, like, for example, Mod Modbus uh, IEC. Uh, you also have, uh, there it is, DNP3. So those protocols are now enabled, and you actually have abilities now available to execute against those kind of, uh, those kind of objects. If we then take a look towards the module itself, but we are going again, the demonstration will showcase it. At this moment, you have five protocols available. So that's not a lot. That's also not little. Those protocols are being used in real OT environments, but we do have to admit that we also see the necessity of other products. Products, protocols, sorry, other protocols. So also from that perspective, we are trying to support the community there and we are working on our own plugins that we can actually publish later on. 
And within Caldera, by default, you have those 52 attack techniques already available that you can actually use against your OT environment. So what is that OT plugin great? Well, it is great, but it also has limitations. The five plugins, well, that's already a limitation. Documentation to create a plugin, that's also a limitation. I don't know how, but due to the documentation, sometimes they are referring to visual pages that were in the previous versions and not in the newer versions. So it's sometimes difficult to actually find the right spot on where you need to configure a certain uh, variable or how you can actually construct like your own anal analyzer or a parser for a certain protocol. But the GitHub, if you create GitHub issues on, on the Caldera uh, GitHub, then they are pretty responsive and they really help out quite often related to the problems you have. And then also, I think you don't want to run Caldera in your OT production environment, so you will need some kind of testbed. That can be virtualized or that can be a physical one, depends on your requirements. I think I said enough about Caldera. Let's uh, see it in action and I will give the word back to Nick that uh, he can explain a little bit about our demonstration. Yes, thank you, Jeroen. So, uh, demo emulation, uh, it's, uh, uh, literally also a demo. You will see that in a minute. Uh, maybe just a word on uh, building or acquiring a uh, physical range. So, uh, my story here is that uh, I started playing around when I was a bit younger uh, with Arduinos because they teach you uh, how to connect cables, how to make a LED burn and everything. And basically that's what a PLC does, right? It has inputs, outputs, like it's very, it looks a bit the same. Then this one here is an ESP32. So I don't know, has anybody seen that today or not? Or because they're also on the back on your cards apparently. Yes, indeed. Uh, so you can also program them yourselves. Pretty nice, by the way. Um, and you can also virtualize uh, stuff. Uh, PLCs, everything. So if you have configuration files or something like that, you can just whip up a virtual PLC and try to pen test against that. But, uh, and I, I actually use that uh, for my research uh, virtual PLC to test on, but it's still not the same as real, uh, or the same as the real thing because we bought this model and this model actually, if you change code, it also moves. So if I execute my attack, suddenly I see something, right? And to be honest, I'm one of those persons that I, I, I need that. I need to see what happens and everything. And I think a lot of people from IT and OT that they, uh, they will benefit from a, a visual approach as well. Because if you want to learn, there is many methods to learn. A visual one to touch, that's uh, something. So we really recommend having something physical. Now, uh, maybe I promised you a demo and uh, an so basically, I'll explain the APT flow here. So uh, what are we going to do? We're going to take Caldera. We're going to spin up a campaign in that one. I will also explain that in a minute then. We're going to go from a workstation. We're going to collect uh, on the service station some uh, important configuration files, maybe some screenshots, maybe a blueprint of the factory, everything that could be interesting in our attack. And then we're going to jump straight into the OT part, and there, through the engineering workstation, we're going to try to transmit packets with, yeah, invalid is maybe a bad word, but with some malicious packets to make certain stuff in the factory move. And of course, uh, because we want to do purple teaming, uh, yeah, we're going to also validate detection capabilities. So I wanted to click here, but I can just do this. Uh -huh. And I think it's a double click. Yes. So uh, demonstration with Caldera, finding OT files. So um, this is the interface of Caldera. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the abilities. Uh, and specifically just to showcase Modbus. So uh, you will see that for Modbus that there are uh, pre-built uh, functions. So basically you can choose whatever you want. There is a default template for it. There are commands that you can give. And you can also give uh, a payload. And um, yeah, this payload is basically this one contains all the functionality of Modbus. Uh, I think that we can choose something from this. But in our environment we didn't have Modbus. So maybe just let's look at the agent. The agent is installed on our service host. And that one we're going to use to try to yeah, scan the network of the factory, maybe find some fi files. It went a bit faster, but uh, we took a uh, 
profile, so the OT profile. And the OT profile is just a collection of all the steps that we're going to do. So here you see that we're going to do 12 steps and it starts from looking at the network, maybe taking some files, uh, so some sy system uh, information discovery, and then uh, here OT emulation find OT source files, well we'll try to get some interesting files from uh, the device there. So maybe let's go to an operation. So we're now running an operation and that operation is against uh, our OT environment. You see here that uh, the status was success. You can see the commands of all the techniques or of all the steps that you do. And sometimes uh, when it says view output, you can also see the output of set uh, technique that was, uh, was executed. So uh, when we go through our chain, uh, we see that uh, here that we found some very interesting factory architecture doc conf and then CPU 1512SPF. That's uh, apparently something of a PLC. For those who are initiated, that's a Siemens PLC. So yeah, I have some files of the configuration, maybe some configuration files themselves. So yeah, as an attacker, that gives me quite some information on their network. We're also going to automatically exfiltrate here, and then uh, yeah, we also try to run backnet, but uh, we forgot to turn on our server, so that's why it says it here a couple of times. <laughs> but in the end, uh, we found uh, also a backnet device, because of course we turned one on, and then yeah, here, uh, OT emulation compressed sensitive files, and then here you see that we uploaded it to a local system, so this is directly to our Caldera, so that we have the information that we were looking for. Um, here we're going to have a look at the exfilt files, so you will see that they are in a zip, in this uh, stage.zip. And if we download them, then you can also see the contents, just to show that we're not lying. <laughs> uh, and typically, these files are very interesting for, for an adversary, because this gives me a lot of information, it might give me uh, information on your network. And if you're unlucky, I also can find your configuration files, and boom, I can build my own virtual PLC right at home, no more need to go to the, to, to even be in your networks. Uh, and then, yeah, I don't know if uh, some people recognize this, but this is a configuration or a picture of a PLC. And uh, these colors also have their functions, so it's inputs and outputs. And so really uh, interesting that, that we can all do this. But then uh, we also were going to do some custom abilities. Um, in our factory, we had an OPC UA server. So what are we going to do? We're going to uh, give uh, or make our custom ability. We're going to ask Caldera install something on our host, and then through the payload file here. So I wrote uh, my own Python files for uh, OPC UA. I worked on that in a minute. Uh, but basically, we put these abilities into Caldera. We're going to add them to our adversary, and then we're also going to add them to our operation, so that they automatically scan. Uh, the PLC, that they try to enumerate it, and that they then also try to um, change some values on the network. So here, this is a, a script, I called it OPC UA Snake, it's a, a bit of a dig to Sandworm. Basically what allows this script, or what does the script do, it allows you to read some namespaces, and it allows you to read some uh, variables, which you then can use of course to influence things in a factory. So for example, if you see uh, a crane or something like that, a variable called crane, well, if you start messing with that value, it might be that you change some stuff, that you make some stuff move. Here, this one is uh, called uh, Fisher Crash, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and this one, uh, basically, we enumerated uh, the PLC, but now, when we have the variables, yeah, we just need to uh, give them some other uh, values, and then, basically, this will be our script that crashes the whole factory, so it's as simple as that. Hey, of course, uh, there went some research into this, but, but uh, here we see that you can do a whole chain. You can just programmatically add them into Caldera, and then suddenly you can rerun these operations again and again. Why do we need this? Because we also want to show the following. Uh, we want to show you detection and alerting, because uh, otherwise it wouldn't be purple teaming. So, as I said before, we have network sensors. Nozomi is one of these network sensors. It gives you an asset list and it gives you alerts, a lot of alerts. So uh, there are some network tools, but not all are created equal. Some have, uh, they all have their benefits, but also their downsides. Uh, so 
Nozomi, for example, uh, here we already see a network scan. So uh, I told you that we were enumerating the network, so that looks fine. Also, uh, we see a new node and all the related alerts to that. Uh, we see 28 pages, so that's quite a lot. But basically, <laughs> it's quite a lot. Um, but basically, um, uh, if you remember from the beginning, I said asset inventory, and then suddenly we have a new node on the network, and that starts scanning. Yeah, this is indications of a, maybe an APT in your, net, your network, right? Um, yeah, there is also some nice things like visuals and everything. This is something that um, Nozomi does very well, actually. They are very good in their um, uh, visual representation. I think we will show it in a minute as well. But I think the important part is here, uh, really, that this uh, network sensor starts giving you information that you didn't have before, right? If you don't monitor your network, you don't know that there is a new host, you don't know that somebody's scanning. So it serves a bit as a double uh, double function here. Yeah, here, uh, this was a bit of a, um interesting thing because your network sensor also picks up if you, for example, connect to another network. So we have uh, a lab setup and uh, yeah, two routers and it also catches that. So pretty powerful stuff. Uh, and then here... Uh, our new node, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is also, uh, we're going to click through the alerts, and then we'll also see that yeah, our new node is suddenly spewing out new function codes. New function codes, what do we mean by that? Maybe reading, writing. Well, uh, for example, if you have a read-only environment, suddenly you see a write, well, you might want to investigate that. And yet again, uh, no, it was the, <laughs> the recording itself that was going. Uh, and we also just wanted to show the vendor for IT real quick, uh, because, and actually also, uh, clarity, but uh, our movie was already a bit long, so we just decided to stick to the core functionality. Uh, but here, uh, you see that Defender, they have another uh, yeah, layout and everything. Uh, what Defender does really good, in my opinion, is um, you if you have the Microsoft ecosystem, uh, MDE is actually really good in that, because it allows you to pivot into your entire network, so you can go from OT to IT pretty quickly. So that's really interesting. If you see a scan from somewhere, you can just go to your asset inventory in MDE, and then boom, you might have your source already. If it has an EDR, you even have logs, timelines. So, uh, And here, uh, I think uh, we clicked on the on the malicious host, and we see already stuff like uh, uh, new asset detected, unauthorized internet connectivity. Somebody closed this alert, so I hope that uh, it was raised to the customer, because if uh, some, some analyst just closed this without looking at it, uh, we might have a problem. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, maybe the results. So uh, we, I told you the attack just to show you. This is uh, Rupert the Moose. He is the plant manager for today. Uh, yeah, he's going to have a bad day, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we laugh a little bit with this, but we also just want to show you that uh, pen testing and OT is not only ransomware to a server and suddenly nothing moves again. No, quite the opposite. If a hacker wants, they can move quite some things in your environment, maybe with a debt uh, as, a, as a result. And uh, yeah, I mean, for a lot of companies, that will mean that you have to close down. So let's not have that. I will move to that side. <laughs> so yeah, I hope you actually saw the relevance of, for example, a tool like Caldera. Again, it's open source. You can play around with it. You now also have your... Uh, own uh, little OT component on your badge. Maybe you can play around with that. Um, so, but Caldera, it's, it's, it's pretty useful. And even if you don't know OT, you can actually start with those abilities and start seeing what it does on a test bed, for example. Now, what are some of our lessons learned here? And maybe also a good one you saw also within our adversary emulation. And typically, that's also what we find in an incident response case, is that the initial foothold always is in the IT environment. So something happens within your IT environment, and then if you have detection capabilities, something strange happens in your OT environment. So incident in IT, strange things in OT, well, that's actually the combination of a potential or a future OT incident, because perhaps something is going on. So that's why I want to stress also the fact if you can combine those monitoring, then you will probably also be much faster in incident response, and prevention uh, is key, but detection is crucial, so detecting and responding on events is also uh, a little bit prevention. 
Now, what else? Well, actually, building out the cyber range, you don't have to buy that one. You can buy. Uh, actually, it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty nice factory, but there are smaller factories you can buy. There are more mobile ones. We actually should buy a mobile one, then we could bring it here. But uh, So you can buy those. You can actually create virtualized one. There's a lot of information out there, and we are also uh, going to provide some additional virtual virtualized controllers in the near future. Monitoring your OT environment, you saw it, those that attack worked. So changing those values on the crane worked. Did you see any alerts in Defender for IoT or Nozomi related to that? No. Why? Because it was a customized attack written by my awesome colleague Nick. But those customized attacks are at the moment still not easy to detect. However, there were a lot of other alerts, meaning there, again, IT, something happened. OT, well, there's something strange going on. So probably you could have prevented the actual execution where they jumped from the IT to OT environment. And then last but not least, eh, start small with your adversary emulation campaigns. Don't do the entire flow because yeah, that doesn't make sense. Try to see what works. Try to do it in small steps and then extend on it. Learn from it and then actually extend it. And then you maybe can grow into continuous purple teaming where you run these campaigns over and over again to see what actually happens and how you are improving your OT environment. And then actually I still have a last point in a club again. So you don't need to be the best dancer. I'll try. No, sorry. <laughs> no, in any case, uh, that's uh, it's recorded as well. Honestly, I think you so, can uh, dance. Sorry for that, uh, but you don't need to be the best dancer, so you don't need to be an OT expert for this. You can actually, if you're an analyst, then you can actually already do a lot. What are our next steps? Well, actually, we are going to extend this book with continuous engineering. Uh, we are going to try and release a virtualized cyber range and publish those additional protocols. That's it for us, and with that, uh, I don't think we we still have. Okay, so that's it for us, and thank you for your attention. Beautiful. Thank you very much, guys. Definitely very interesting to hear and see all that. So appreciate that. We do have a couple minutes still for some questions. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand, and I will bring you the mic. Don't be shy. We have two minutes. I wasn't sure if, if you really uh, conducted some actual uh, testing on your customer sites yet with that stuff or, okay. I was, oh, oh, oh. thank you. Yeah, no, uh, yes, we did uh, already some uh, pet tests at our customers as well, but this one was just more to showcase that if you buy a range, if you, I, basically at our um, headquarters we have a whole detection stack with all these sensors and we just put the factory next to that and this is to hone our skills. But what we also do with that uh, is we just invite everybody and we say okay sit around the table and we'll go through the attack but just talk about your part of the factory here. Talk about your, uh, why are you on the team here, right? Uh, show us your expertise and that is how we learn and iterate very fast. So yes, we of course pen test at our customers but this is more training and Making sure that if one person did the test, he takes the results from that, he takes the code from that, like with my script, and then you put it into Caldera and you make sure that everybody from your team learns. Because I always hear it's very hard to find trained OT people. I agree. And that's why we try to build solutions as well. I hope that was a, an answer. And I think, yeah, maybe to add on that, so I think the cyber ranges you saw we built, so those were actually on request of the customer. And there we also do like the pen testing with their actual uh, versions on, of the controllers and stuff that they are running on, on, on their production environments. So based on those ranges, we do a lot of testing. And within, if they have a controlled environment, we do a lot of testing as well. Uh, and individual components or updates from a certain thing. Typically, that's done via code reviews as well. So uh, those are the kind of things we are actually at this moment uh, executing. But this is another stage. And imagine you have a customer, and we had that in the past, that is requesting like, okay, I want to buy a detection tool for OT. 
what's the best tool? Well, now you can actually run, okay, which attacks do you want to see, which attacks are detected, how are they detected, and what's the most easiest one for you to use. Great, thanks. We still have time for one more, if we have one more. Anyone else? If not, then we'll just say thank you again once more, guys. Round of applause, and yeah, enjoy the viewers and networking later.